All right, so we're going to uh, put some notes down about uh, what you learned in your activity the other day uh, related to electrochemistry. And you'll recall that uh, what we were measuring was the potential difference between your two electrodes in uh, each of the samples. And uh, what we were looking at was called a reduction potential. And uh, today we need to introduce what we mean by potential to begin with and then how it applies to these electrochemical cells. So for example, um, let's take a step back. And for those of you who aren't in, currently in physics or haven't had any physics, it's going to be a little confusing at first, but uh, try and bear with me. Uh, basically, um, if you have uh, electric potential or voltage uh, is defined uh, as a ratio of electric potential energy to charge. And that's going to be important here in a second. Uh, but um, we want to compare that uh, electric potential energy to something we're more familiar with. And so if you imagine if I have a single mass uh, and then I put a separate mass next to it, any two objects in the universe that have mass uh, are going to exert a gravitational force on each other. Right? We know that from uh, Newton's universal law of gravitation from physics. Uh, and basically, uh, if I were to remove one of those two masses, then I would no longer have a force, right? Because one of the two masses in the equation would be zero, and you can't have a force uh, unless you have the two objects that can and can exert that attraction on each other. But what we do still have is what we call a gravitational field. And gravitational field is basically a predictor of what the gravitational force would be if there were another mass there. And so that's an important concept uh, in our introductory physics classes. And we have a similar thing, uh, of course, uh, in the form of Coulomb's law, where if we have two objects that have charge, then again, they exert either an attractive or repulsive force on each other. But in order to have a force, you have to have two charges. And so if you remove one of those two charges, you no longer have uh, an electric force because there's nobody to push it or pull on but there is still what we call an electric field. And uh, those, again, are important concepts. Fields are important in physics. Uh, but what I want to use those as a jumping off point to kind of connect to energy. Just like if we had uh, two objects, they have gravitational potential energy between them, and we use the example from physics of the Earth and a ball, for example. That ball-Earth system has gravitational potential energy so long as there's two masses. But if we talk about just a single object, just the ball itself, it has mass, but there's no gravitational potential energy because it takes two uh, objects to have gravitational potential energy. Similarly, if we have two charges, then there is an electric potential energy between them. But if I remove one of those charges, there's no longer electric potential energy. And so just like it was useful for us to talk about a gravitational field versus a gravitational force so that that field could predict what the force would be, we do the same thing with uh, electric uh, force and electric field. And we can do the same thing with energy. So if we take the quantity that we're calling electric potential energy, in other words, right, how much energy the two objects have because they're charged and they're near each other and therefore applying forces on each other, uh, then if we divide out one of those two charges, we can talk about the concept that we call electric potential or voltage. So that's just a, kind of an introduction and definition of what voltage means or what electric potential means. And um, we've in physics, there are more nuanced uh, differences between these terms, uh, voltage, electric potential, and potential difference. Uh, but for how we're going to be using it in chemistry, basically those terms we can use um, uh, pretty much interchangeably. Uh, we won't worry about the subtle differences. All right, so we used copper and zinc. And the reason when we put copper and zinc uh, in the, the same beaker together uh, as electrodes uh, connected to the voltmeter uh, we saw a voltage because the copper and zinc have different properties, right? They're going to attract electrons differently, and as a result, uh, they're going to form anions differently. And, um, of course, you know that uh, they're both metals, and so they're both going to form cations. They're going to lose electrons uh, to either form a cation, or they can stay neutral and be an atom, but they're never going to form uh, a negative ion, an anion. And so what's going on there? Uh, well, 
basically you found that between copper and zinc, uh, you got a positive reading on the multimeter whenever copper was connected uh, to the red uh, multimeter lead, right? What we call the positive lead. And you got a, n a negative voltage whenever uh, copper was on the red when compared to zinc. So what does that mean? That means that uh, the copper was doing a better job or was better fitted to be reduced, to gain electrons. Now again, that doesn't mean that it wants to gain electrons as an, I uh, as an atom and become a negative ion, an anion. It just means that when paired up against zinc, zinc was better at forming a positive ion from the metal. In other words, uh, being oxidized. And so we know that zinc's gonna lose because it forms a cation more readily. And so any zinc atoms will lose electrons and be oxidized. And we can write the half reaction for that. You did this last year in first year. You can say that the zinc uh, solid metal will lose two electrons and form a zinc plus two ion. Well, where, what's, that's only gonna happen if somebody can take the electrons, right? And so who's hanging around that can take the electrons? Well, the copper. And so copper is going to gain those electrons. And so we say copper is reduced, right? And this is, a, again, a classic redox reaction that you learned in first year, but now we're gonna apply it uh, to these electrochemical cells. Again, what you wanna notice is that uh, the element that is more likely to be reduced has what we call a higher reduction potential will be the one that will be reduced and at the same time, uh, the electrons that it gains are gonna come from the element that is not as likely to be reduced. In other words, the one that's more likely to be oxidized, and that's gonna be uh, the one with the lower reduction potential. So how do we know what these reduction potentials are? Well, we do exactly what you did in your activity. We, uh, we measure them. We get in the experiment, and we get in the lab, we measure them, and we come up with these tables. And as you know from physics, uh, gravitational potential energy, or any potential energy for that matter, has to be relative. It has to be measured against a baseline of some kind. And so we've chosen um, uh, hydrogen ion uh, gaining electrons as being what we call the standard. Uh, and that's why you can see from this chart that it's defined as being zero. And so uh, that standard electrode uh, is what we're going to call the baseline. That's where we're going to measure everybody else compared to because you have to have a reference point. And so we build these tables uh, just like you did in lab. And uh, we come up with these reduction potentials or voltages and uh, for the reduction half reaction. And then in this electrochemical cell then you need a couple of things. You need your two electrodes Right? Those are the two metals that you placed into the solution. Uh, well, one of them is going to take on the role of what we call the cathode. And the cathode, by definition, is where reduction takes place. And I'm going to give you several mnemonic devices uh, to remember these by. Uh, I always remember red cat. Uh, and um, you can remember that uh, both R and C are consonants. Uh, there's lots of different ways to remember that. But by definition, the cathode is where the reduction takes place. And so in the example with copper and uh, zinc, copper is more likely to be reduced. And so the copper electrode is what we're going to call the cathode. And it's going to be deemed positive uh, in charge. And we're going to talk about that more in just a second. On the other hand, the other electrode will be what we call the anode. And the anode is where oxidation takes place, the one that's oxidized. And again, there's several different ways you can remember that. Uh, you can say they both start with vowels, or you can remember an, ox, um, and uh, just whatever mnemonic advice you come up with or, or learn somewhere, just use it and uh, keep these straight. And then I also noted that uh, cathode, right, has a T in it, which looks like a positive sign to me, so we're going to designate that positive, and anode has an N in it, uh, which stands for negative, all right? So then uh, we come up with these uh, standard reduction potentials. Uh, and again, they're relative to some baseline called zero. Uh, 
and uh, that's just an explanation of the notation. Uh, the electric potential is given the capital E symbol. Uh, we put RED because we're talking about the reduction potential, uh, the potential for it actually being reduced. And then of course, the, the floating knot represents standard conditions, usually room temperature and pressure. All right, and so we have uh, these tables and these charts. And so we can now predict if you put two uh, metals as the electrodes, you can predict who's going to be reduced and who's going to be oxidized. You'll notice that the one that has the higher reduction potential is the one that's more likely to be reduced. And so if you look on our chart here, we can see we've got uh, copper and zinc. And of course, copper has a uh, potential of 0.34 positive, and zinc is a negative 0.76. So copper, with its higher reduction potential, is more likely to be reduced than zinc. So think about that. Uh, these are the reduction half reactions. They have to do with copper losing electrons, uh, in, or excuse me, gaining electrons. Is it possible for copper to lose electrons? Well, of course, the answer is yes. And so if it were to go the opposite direction, what do you expect the potential to do? Well, yeah, it would flip signs, right? So the way we're going to determine what the total voltage will be when we make one of these electrochemical cells is we're going to take the re standard reduction potential of what's happening at the cathode, right? Because that's the forward process. That's what's actually happening. And then we have to take the opposite, right? The, we have to subtract the standard reduction potential of the element that's at the anode because it's not being reduced, it's not the forward reaction, it's the reverse, and so we flip the sign. So in this case, you would take uh, the standard reduction potential of the copper, which is 0.34, and then you would subtract this reduction potential of what's happening at the anode, which is zinc, which is negative 0.76, and as a result, you get 0.34 plus 0.76. And that makes sense, right? Because at the, at the cathode, we're wanting this reduction potential to take place, or I say wanting, right? That's more likely that it's gonna take place. And so that positive value uh, adds to the overall reduction potential of the cell. And then the forward process of zinc uh, gaining electrons is not likely to happen, right? It's a negative 0.76. And so if that's not likely to happen, then the reverse reaction is. And so when we flip them, when we get copper being reduced like it typically wants to, and we get zinc being oxidized like it typically wants to, we end up with a larger overall potential. And of course, the applications of this are endless. We have uh, your, your batteries, basically, are electrochemical cells. Uh, there's been uh, huge breakthroughs in technology over the last uh, you know, couple of decades in uh, batteries, uh, but they're all still running on basically the same principle. You have two different metals, that have different affinities for electrons, have different uh, tendencies to be oxidized or reduced. Uh, and if we then uh, introduce those in the same cell, one will be oxidized, the other will be reduced. And as those electrons change hands, the movement of those electrons is what we call electric current. And we can uh, then calculate uh, what voltage, right? What uh, difference uh, is gonna push that current through. So we'll talk more about uh, how we calculate that, but I wanna look at this example. You saw this last year, but I just wanna bring it to your attention again. All right, here's a typical electrochemical cell, what we call a voltaic cell, uh, where we have copper uh, as the cathode and zinc uh, as the anode. Again, copper is more likely to be reduced. So you see the electrons going towards the copper Zinc is more likely to be oxidized. You see the electrons leaving the zinc. And you have to have a wire, right? In our experiment, the wire was that, uh, basically those alligator clips and the copper wire that led through the multimeter. And they show in the picture here, right? Uh, measuring with a voltmeter as well. Uh, so that you can see that potential difference, just like you did. Uh, but uh, the, there has to be a path for the electrons and that's the wire. Now, remember, when you did your experiment, uh, you first 
just checked the potential in pure water. And did you see a voltage? Yes, because again, there were different potentials, reduction potentials for the two different metals, and so you read a volt, uh, voltage on the voltmeter. But when I, in part two, when I had you try and determine the current, when it was in just plain water, you didn't see a current. So why didn't you see a current? Well, for one thing, I, as soon as uh, the electrons move, start to move from one uh, terminal to the other, that's a separation of charge. And so we have an electric field created uh, that opposes that movement of charge. Um, as a result, with that separation of charge, you can kind of imagine as the electrons move away, uh, they're leaving behind positive charges behind them and those positive charges attract them back. And so as they move away, uh, they're feeling a pull back. And so it will kind of reach an equilibrium, right? It'll stop moving. And so what we need is we need a way to balance out that separation of charge as it happens. And that is the purpose of the salt bridge in a chemical cell. Uh, basically, uh, as the electrons move from the zinc side to the copper side, if we only moved the negative electrons, then we would have an imbalance of charge and that electric field would keep the current from flowing. But with the salt bridge, it allows positive charges, right? The cations that are already in the solution to move from the side that has the anode to the side that has the cathode. Now, because those positive charges moving balance out the movement of the negative charges of the electrons, the electrons can keep moving, and so we can have electric current continue to flow. The way we provided that in the experiment was, instead of just using the water, you switched over to uh, the saline solution. That provided the charges necessary to move uh, to help balance out uh, the movement of the electrons, and that's when you saw current. And of course, when you contaminated your distilled water by putting the leads back into uh, the the distilled water from the saline solution, now you have some charge carriers, right, that can move, uh, some ions that can move, and as a result, uh, you started to see current slowly grow as you continually uh, contaminated your, your pure water. All right, so another interesting thing to note is um, if you look at the microscopic view here in this diagram, uh, at the anode, the zinc metal, right, which is losing electrons, turns into zinc ions. Well, those zinc ions then, of course, repel each other. Uh, we're no longer held together by the metallic bonds of the uh, neutral atoms that are just playing, uh, you know, electronic hot potato. And so now they repel each other and they break off and go into solution. Uh, of course, off also, of course, there's uh, the ion dipole attraction between the water in the solution and those uh, zinc ions. And so they go floating around into the solution. As a result, what happens to the zinc metal at the anode? It actually loses mass, right? The metal uh, atoms that were joined together have some of them broken apart as ions floating off into solution, and so the anode will start to disappear. It will actually lose mass over time, so long as current's flowing right, and it's forming uh, new zinc ions. At the same time, on the cathode side, uh, you can see from the picture, the copper ions that are floating around in solution, and by the way, I should have said that earlier. Uh, I should have made that clear. You notice in the picture, uh, the uh, solution on the right is blue. That's because it's a, a copper nitrate solution. Uh, on the left side, we added the zinc uh, metal to a zinc nitrate solution. Uh, so we didn't do that in our, uh, just our introductory activity just because I wanted to get, get you a feel for what potential was. Uh, but if we set up an actual cell, we're going to have both the solution with the ions and the metal. And so the ions that are in the copper uh, nitrate solution on the right will grab electrons off of the electrode, right, that came from the zinc side. As zinc gave up electrons, the electrons went through the wire at the top and then uh, came down through the copper uh, cap cathode. And those ions grab those electrons. As a result, uh, the ions in solution come out of solution and form uh, copper atoms, and then they're attracted to and bond to the existing copper atoms in the cathode uh, through metallic bonds. As a result, the cathode will actually gain mass. It will increase in size and mass, while the anode uh, 
decreases in mass because the uh, metal is turning into ions. And at the cathode, the ions are turning into solid metal. Again, by the half reactions that you can see uh, written below the beakers. All right, and so again, as the positive charges in the solution move towards the cathode to balance out the movement of the negative electrons moving through the wire, uh, we can continue to have current flowing through, uh, through the wire. And so this is again how basic a battery works. As long as you have uh, a, a way for the electrons to travel through the wire and a way for the ions to travel through the solution in some way, either through a salt bridge or we can use a porous wall that separates the two types of solution. Um, as long as there's a way for the charge to move, uh, it'll continue to the, uh, transfer electrons, right? The electric current uh, to power your, your device, all right? Um, and then the last thing I want to do is I want to kind of tie this back to the very first uh, experiment we did in the year, right? So we're coming full circle. If you'll recall, the very first experiment we did had to do with an activity series. And we took metals and we put them in different solutions and tried to observe whether or not there was a reaction or not. And you'll recall, we took zinc metal and we put it in copper sulfate solution. Uh, and we took... Uh, copper metal and put it in zinc, I'm sorry, nitrate, zinc nitrate solution. And so uh, one of them had a reaction, the other didn't. Well, which one did? Well, in that case, the reaction we were watching for was actually the oxidation reaction. And so when you put copper in with zinc nitrate, zinc's already a, a cation, it's already lost electrons, uh, the copper metal the only way it's going to lose electrons is if it wins out against zinc in losing electrons. In other words, it would have to be a better at oxidation than zinc was. And if you look back at your results, you'll notice that it didn't. There was no reaction when you added copper metal to zinc nitrate. On the other hand, when you added the zinc to the, copper, the cupric nitrate, we did have a reaction. And the reason was um, the zinc was better at losing electrons, being oxidized, than the copper. So this is full circle, right? These, your last experiment is the exact opposite result. Uh, we're not testing who is most likely to be oxidized. We're testing who's most likely to be reduced. And so it's the exact same result in the opposite order. The magnesium you'll recall, was the most likely to be oxidized. And in this experiment, you found that the magnesium was the least likely to be reduced. Uh, and so on and so forth. Just like silver and copper were not likely to be oxidized, that makes them more likely to be reduced. So we kind of came back to where we first started the year. All right. Uh, so then uh, we have several practice problems, and we're going to do math and such. Uh, but I'm going to leave you with this question to wrestle with on your own. I'll show you the, the values, right? Iron uh, has uh, a reduction potential of 0. Oh, sorry. Nope. Uh, zero, negative 0. 0.44 when uh, iron positive 2 gains 2 electrons. And silver, as you can see, silver has a reduction potential of positive 0 0.80 when it uh, gains its single electron. So I'll let you think through who then uh, would be oxidized, who would be reduced. You can write the half reactions, which are going to be these two, but one of them, of course, is going to be flipped. And then you're going to calculate the cell potential, uh, indicate the signs of the electrodes, which direction do the electrons flow, and which direction do the cations and ions in solution go. All right, so think through that. Uh, we'll work more of these like this. Uh, but then one last thing, real quick. Uh, notice. What did we do? What are we going to do with the two electrons or three electrons?
And the answer for right now is absolutely nothing. When you're calculating the potentials, you don't worry about how many moles of electrons. And the reason is, if you look back at our definition of electric potential, it's already energy per charge. So it's an intensive property. So when you go to uh, calculate potentials, you don't worry about how many electrons or how many moles of electrons. But when we find out later, uh, when we're finding the, the current and the um, actual charge movement to find the uh, energy, then uh, we'll account for the number of moles. Uh, but for now, this is the one time, right? 99% of the time, you have to worry about coefficients whenever you're doing any calculations. But uh, calculating the cell potential, uh, you do not worry about how many moles of electrons. You do have to worry about it when you're balancing the, the half reactions, right? Uh, or using the half reactions to find the balanced chemical equation, but not in terms of finding the electric potential. All right.